I'm going to introduce uh, David Reed uh, from Microsoft, and uh, he and his company, Microsoft, have done some tremendous change, and they've done so without biting off anyone's ear. So, thanks, Joe. Imagine for a moment your company has grown over more than three decades. You own the industry. You are the industry. One morning you wake up and realize somebody's changed the rules. A couple of years ago, Microsoft woke up in that new world. That change, and you all have feel felt it at some point. Do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy road construction? You do when it's done. So think about your journey through change as the end result. We just announced a massive reorganization of Microsoft. Anybody see that? Maybe? So much so that we've decided, we being Steve Ballmer, <laughs> that he should retire and bring in a new CEO so that that person can manage the rest of the journey. This change is major reconstruction on campus. We just acquired a whole bunch of new employees. Who knows, maybe our next CEO came along with the deal. But that change is something we knew was coming. Our existing systems couldn't handle the change. Do you have organically grown systems where you are? Things that just kind of grew up where nobody was paying attention just to get the job done right now. So did we. And we have a bigger problem at Microsoft than most of you. Do you are you from a software company? Also, some of you may have the same problem. Because you make software for a living, clearly you should make your own set of comp software. <laughs> Not a good plan, unless it's core your business, if that's what you do. I came to Microsoft IT from the product groups. I used to work in SQL Server and in Office. I've been in the field as a consultant with MCS. I've got a lot of different hats that I've worn. IT hired me because I've been a previous victim of the incentive compensation system. I know what this complexity is like. I know end users that are still in the field, sales people, <coughs> consultants. How many sales people do you think Microsoft has? Anybody wants to throw out a guess? Hint, it's on the slide. About 30,000 sales people. We do about 40 million transactions a day through the incentive compensation systems. It's kind of busy. <laughs> and the people who manage it, those of you in sales ops, want to change it all the time to adjust. You have to. We know we need to be able to do that as a devices and services company. We are going to have to grow to be able to change on a dime. Bring in a brand new company, bring in entire new product lines, if we're going to compete. Our competitors are that agile. They were born digital. They were born on the internet. They were born on the internet. We helped create. <laughs> and now we have to play the same game by new rules. You all live that because your industries are all going to change at some variation of that pace. Perhaps not at internet speed. Depends on what you do. We needed to buy something because we couldn't build it fast enough. We didn't want to spend the millions of dollars in R&D to create it. This is where we want to go. Right now, our sales specialist. Anybody a compensation specialist? Are you? Are you largely transactional, like the left-hand side here? You mostly use the tool, you make the changes, you deal with the disputes, you're just constantly in transactional mode. <coughs> Raise your hand if you spend most of your time in analysis, 
in an advisory position, helping people make better decisions, executives and salespeople. Wow, you guys are ahead of the game. You're where we are going. We have begun that process. Accentive, now become, has helped us get there. We want to get to the place where our field compensation analysts are truly analysts. They're trusted advisors. When someone calls, it's not for help. It's for advice. One of those things that was worth the investment and worth partnering with Accenture to outsource parts of the business that we think is largely transactional so that our employees can focus on the analysis, the insight, helping the business be more efficient and more effective. Joe, I'm going to show you a little cartoon. <coughs> This is life at Microsoft. This is what Microsoft life was like uh, before this system that they call Entice, uh, which has become. consultant to help you out can certainly make it smoother. 
and of course, choosing the right solution. Do you know the answers to the questions that resulted in these for your business? What's your size? What's your scale? Are you willing to fly to Turkey to interview customers of your business? <coughs> we sent people to Istanbul, to Gay Paris, to London, wherever the customers were that were even close to our scale. We did some serious due diligence before we picked these guys. This is something I would like for all of you, speaking as a sales guy, to consider for your users. We started with the perspective that the field came first. This is just a sample of the Bill of Rights that we created to give. <coughs> Whoops. successful at something and then been punished for it. Yeah. <laughs> I think some of you have. No success goes unpunished, right? Incentive compensation is well on its way. We are more than halfway done with that transformation. Clearly we have something else that needs to be fixed. Last year Kevin Turner, our COO, if you don't know who he is, put me and a bunch of other people with number three with a bullet in his commitments to Steve Palmer. Our partner incentives, the things that, Microsoft partners in the room, any of you? A few. How easy is it to deal with our incentive programs as a partner? You, you smiled, so obviously you've been through that. Yeah, I'm, I'm with CDW, so oh. we get the, uh, as a large account reseller, uh, it changes on an annual basis trying to react to those for our field and inside sales. <coughs> it's been a challenge with tools. Kevin's promised to fix that. And I get to keep my job if we fix that. <laughs> right now, well, we are replacing seven different massive systems. To give you a sense of perspective, Microsoft pays out a little bit less than a billion dollars to employees as sales incentives. Any guesses how much we pay partners? Almost seven times that. So these systems currently process everything from huge OEM checks to small solution incentives for people who are implementing Office 365 for a customer. We are going to do it with one system when we're done. 
because we need the flexibility to be able to see into the business, find the overlaps, because right now some of our partner programs overlap quite heavily. We've even discovered that we're paying some of you more than once for the same thing. <laughs> Any of you feel like you might be at risk for that in your own compensation plans? Add at least one nod back there. Yeah. The analysis that we can do with the BCOM system when we're done, we'll be able to look at both our employees incentives and our partners incentives in the same way and do that analysis. I'm not supposed to tell you, so I'll ask you instead. What is the industry average compensation? How many people are incented for every dollar of revenue, typically? Just throw me some numbers. What do you think? Best case scenario, worst case scenario? I average. 12 to 18. 12 to 18? Okay, that's higher than the number I've heard on average. Anybody else have a different experience? Five. Five? I've heard three to seven is the average. At Microsoft, in the incentive space, not counting partners, 72. <laughs> when we add these guys in, it gets bigger. We have more than a million partners. We have a massively complex system. This causes, in seven different ways, confusion. How many of you, raise your hand if you have a single view of the truth for your child? Anybody? I'm halfway there. Nobody. <coughs> That's one of the things we have to get to. Because without it, we have different divisions competing with each other, arguing about who's paying who and how much. We've got to get to the place where we have that single view of the truth. Ever fight with somebody because they have different numbers than you from a different system? Mm, lots of nods out there. <clears throat> Partners have seen the playbook for one of the three programs. We have over 48 different partner programs. It's really tough to rationalize, and it's difficult for them to assimilate because of how it's presented. BCOM is giving us a way to present it in a unified fashion and analyze it in a unified fashion so we can simplify it. Thousands of pages of documentation shouldn't be necessary. We need to make a paradigm shift to use the cliche. Anybody want that for your business? I do. That's what I signed up to build for Microsoft. These are our primary components for one plan. Recognize any of those phases? Anybody here in trade promotions as well as in center comp, sales comp? These are from the trade promotions model. They overlap, surprisingly, <coughs> with incentives. Would you expect that you could pay your partners with the same system that you pay your employees? There's no reason you can't. I challenge you to look at it. And so when the businesses tell you they need different systems, ask why. Show me the model. Show me what the tool can't do. At Microsoft, we chose specifically as one of our core engineering principles to accept what we took off the shelf without customization. Do you know how many people still cry themselves to sleep about this after some? We do software, and we're not allowed to choose what we just bought. We can configure it, but we will not code anything new. This hurt. <laughs> There's some people out there nodding. You bought some software that you've customized and lived to regret it. Don't. Did you want to talk to key requirements, Joe? This is how they meet our partner incentives requirements.
Well, I'm, what I'm going to actually introduce Alex, who's uh, actually running the One Plan project uh, from Accenta, um, now become, um, to talk about key requirements and more about the project. I have my own. Thank you. Can I? Well, good morning. Uh, Alex Almeida. I, uh, I'm one of the uh, consultants at, uh, at BCOM. And um, I was honored with the, um, the opportunity to bring to you some of our experiences doing consulting with BCOM uh, for a global team. Uh, I'm based here in the U.S. and I've been uh, coordinating our team in, in the Microsoft One Plan project. It's a, it's a fascinating environment. And uh, as we engage with, uh, with Microsoft, uh, you know, a number of things that we had to do, of course, but and, and as we thought about this, this event, and as we every day talk to our friends in our product team, uh, we're always looking for, for themes that would define the space. Um, our, our mission is to engage with clients and solve problems just like uh, David described. And uh, the theme that uh, uh, we would firstly like to uh, discuss or bring up for, for some discussion with you today is complexity. Uh, and, and Microsoft brought, brought that uh, very, very vividly uh, for, for our entire team, the whole company. Because um, it's just inherent in the, uh, in the business. When you look at uh, the way you create and sell software, it's, it's unlike anything else. Uh, you know, we haven't been around for, for, for a while. Uh, we always look at industries and try to draw parallels. Uh, software is one of those that's pretty difficult to model. Uh, the way people organize, and uh, uh, just to give an example, how would you structure a software company? What makes sense to put together? What works and what doesn't? Uh, everything that uh, David describes has to do with that. It's, it's uh, inherent to their business. So uh, organizational design is, is a, a, a challenge to Microsoft. We're talking about a company that operates uh, pretty much like, uh, I'm trying to think of an organization that is in 180 countries. Microsoft is one of those. They're doing business in the confines of Africa. People are using Office and Windows in any, all over the world. It's a little like Coca-Cola. Uh, and they have very, very uh, specific requirements. The, uh, the transactional model is very unique because people can use Microsoft products in so many different ways. You can go to a store and buy it. You can call CDW and get a whole bunch of it. You can download some of that. You can even rent Microsoft. How do you bring that all together and create incentives and manage an ecosystem of people or, or you know, a whole environment where you're supposed <coughs> to create the right incentives and, and get that to work? So um, Microsoft really struck us as a complex environment. And in the theme of complexity, it's one that uh, definitely is, is, is up there. But my role here today is also to, as representative of our, our entire global team, to bring you some other examples of uh, um, compensation challenges that we have encountered that we believe could be, could be useful just for reflection uh, by, by you guys. So uh, here's an interesting one. Um, Vodafone is um, a mobile mobile operator in, based in, in the UK. They're the second largest in the world. And uh, fascinating business, uh, particularly uh, for, for, for BCOM. We look at compensation as a whole. Uh, we always thought of uh, um, the challenge that companies are facing when they're trying to design compensation has more to do with understanding what make people behave a certain way. So our company is all about designing those processes that will get people to behave in optimal ways for themselves and for the companies they work for. And uh, when you try to do that, for a company operating in 32 countries, over 400 billion subscribers, 90,000 employees, that's inherently complex. That's, that's very challenging. Anything changes on you all the time. Uh, and for for uh, Vodafone specifically, uh, the challenge was not around paying uh, sales compensation, it was around just paying people in general. It was HR, it, it, annual salary reviews, short-term incentives, but all by 30 different markets. Each country in Europe, as united as the EU is, uh, each country operates very, very differently. They have different legislation. How do you design for that? How do you, uh, across the board, get people to, to, to behave the way that is good for them and good for, for the business? So um, Vodafone, in 32 countries was able, if we go back real quick, 
to become the second in the world. I mean, uh, it takes 32 countries to even, not even come close to China more. It gives a, a sense of proportion in terms of, of uh, what's out there. But uh, uh, Vodafone really struck us as, because they operated in this such heterogeneous environment, it really uh, challenged uh, the way uh, them as a company needed to, to deal with uh, plan design. So complexity is there. Microsoft is a great example. Vodafone is one too. I would like to uh, change topic a little bit. Uh, the next one is change. I like change topics to change. Uh, it didn't sound quite right. But um, as we engage with product, and I brought that up, uh, there are two things that we believe define the space of compensation. And uh, as obvious as that may sound to you, uh, it always strike me personally and our team uh, as, as we work as, as together in projects. How, how surprised or taken aback people are when the business says, well, what we designed last year is changing because we are reworking. We, we bought a new company. Um, so, so that is a very recurring theme for us. Uh, as we talk to our peers in project teams, there's always that sense of, oh, no, not again. And uh, for us, as we jump from account to account and we work with several clients, that is the pattern. So, so injecting that into your uh, mode of operation is very important. So we made it our mission to, to understand how we can make change just a fact of life rather than a surprise. So, so I felt it would make sense for us today to explore a, a few sources of change. It can come from anywhere. But, but certain seem to be more, more common and more relevant. The first one is bosses, CEOs, as they retire and new ones come aboard and uh, they change all the time. It's, it's their mission to do things differently. Uh, and, and that has a direct impact on sales. Uh, that would definitely be stated in the audience. Everybody knows that sales compensation has, in, I'm back to sales compensation by the way, a material impact on top line revenue, therefore bottom line, across the whole performance of the company. Sales compensation is absolutely instrumental to anything any company wants to do in terms of uh, changing. So for that, I would like to uh, explore one case that we developed with a client, which we cannot disclose for obvious reasons. This is very uh, uh, specific information the way they, they, they manage a certain process. But what we did was, was fascinating because we're, we were able to collect some data and do some analytics. And with that, we were able to explore certain uh, scenarios. And uh, in those scenarios, I'm going to switch gears here real quick. You will see what data uh, did for a client. So, and, and how, I'm going to do some on the fly editing here. Every size in my Okay, that's better, right? So we have quarters. So what we did here is some, some, some analytics. Uh, we collected some data with a client, and uh, we're trying to understand how uh, plan design affected overall performance. We're looking at a mature product with solid market share, and this is a blended uh, um, commission rate, and the size of the bubble tells you the revenue. And it only makes any sense when you compare that with new products. That's what we're going to do now. So when we look back at uh, historical data, we added three new products and we tested that a long time to see how plan design, how commission planning, this is very straightforward, just commission plans uh, affected performance of a new product. So the first case that we studied or reviewed was this company was uh, somewhat frustrated, significantly frustrated with the performance of new products in that industry, the ability to put out new products regularly is absolutely critical to survival. The stock is measured on it, the pipeline, the product pipeline, pretty much like pharmaceuticals. A lot of industries, a few industries are, are, are like that. So what we, the history of the data told us, and this is as we took data and uh, the history of each product. So quarter one for each product is a different point in time, but if you just slide them together, and you play the evolution of that product. What you're seeing here, the significant part is that new product was not being significantly more incentivized than the old product. So 
people got the same permission uh, or the same incentives as the mature product. And as you see, across 20 quarters, and uh, you know, it goes up and down because things shift on a quarterly basis, that product failed to succeed or to produce the results that company wanted or expected of a new product. So as we switch to, big, okay, let's redesign it, try to be more aggressive on, new, on, on a new product. Let me go back all the way back here. So here's another new product, but we're going to pay high commission on that. We're just going to pay, uh, you know, we're, we're going to reward people for selling the products. Pretty, pretty uh, obvious, right? As, as you would imagine, people took it. Uh, and, you know, at 4%, uh, the product got sold off the shelf. It was significant uh, uh, revenue, significant market share, success story. So uh, compensation works great. But now, the issue with the, that new product that we saw, the, the new product one, was that people uh, uh, refrained to sell the products because it was much more challenging. They were taking their annuity off the mature product and kind of, uh, well, why should I work very hard for a new product that I have to educate people where I can just go and sit on top of something that I can just collect revenue off? Well, that worked for them. Now, the company did you know, significantly succeed with product number two, but at a very high cost. So a very interesting uh, case was, let's try something different. And we had enough products to try this. So when we go to product three, you see that our client tried something different this time. So yes, we'll start with significant higher, significantly higher commissions as we launch the products. But let's adjust that as we go so that, you know, Salesforce is happy. But we are too. So you see this trend towards lower commissions by the new product. So this is trending, the, the yellow bubble is trending left. So this is good for the company, good for the people. Well, not as good as 4% blended, but uh, certainly uh, uh, healthier for, for the business. So the point is, you can, if, if you have data and you get deep into uh, 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 understanding how design has worked for you and how it can change the way people operate, it's very significant. So uh, this was a very interesting uh, uh, story. We wanted to share that with you. How was that received from the sales force? And maybe I should have asked first, what was the communication from an expectation setting with that lower rate? Yeah, this is a good one. Um, it was arbitrary in the sense that it, it was it is what it is. So uh, they complain, but uh, their leverage is somewhat <coughs> limited. So um, at that point, um, you know, a, a new product at a very high rate, uh, it was not perceived. So, so the leverage they got, it, it was perceived as an exception. So it was kind of uh, easier for them to bring it back down because that 4% was sort of a, uh, an exceptional, exceptionally higher rate. Yeah, so they were they were able to more smoothly, of course, more smoothly bring it down. So the premium then you, you kind of communicate is that like you have a baseline of two and you get a premium over the first quarter or the first number of quarters, Precisely. and then you start dropping the premium. We do this at Microsoft with what we call incubation products. We have teams that are focused specifically on building and growing that business. But we don't pay commission. We pay we we have we have a, we have a quota mm -hmm. so we, we don't pay a commission this is they, they you can still adjust your quota in a, in sure. a, in a way to get exactly the same result yeah and yeah. so as it transitions from incubation into part of the core product set people understand that it's going to be shifting down to a different so set part of its expectation part of its sales force our incubation sales team don't care what they sell they aren't emotionally attached to the product <laughs> they're out there to grow market share they stay in incubation when the product moves to something different, to a more standard product set, and the traditional salespeople who are in the relationship and then pick that up. So it's a blend of both people and process. The technology enables us to actually figure out how to do it most efficiently, give the salespeople something they, are, they feel good about and want to keep doing, and at the same time, grows market share and total revenue for us. How do you, excuse me, how do you incent the existing sales force to take part in, in helping that incubation period? Meaning, they must have relationships that they can leverage to help those people? Is there, is there any 
We have a very loosely integrated sales force that are tightly integrated on relationships. Okay. Incubation has to be a global team, depends on the product that they're targeting. SharePoint, for example, we grew big fast. We was our fastest billion dollar business until our next fastest billion dollar business, which was Windows Azure. The sales force that did the incubation sales partnered with the relationship folks on the ground, account technology specialists, account executives, who have those long-term relationships. We bring them in when we see opportunities. When we, the customer is asking about something or has an opportunity to do something different, when they're building a system from scratch, when they're integrating with something, when they're migrating to Office 365. As that knowledge transfers, the incubation team is almost incented to grow those folks so that they can be ready for the next incubation set of products. We do this frequently enough that it's a two or three year process to go from incubation to field sales. And over time, the field sellers know, I gotta grow up on that, I gotta sharpen my tools, I gotta learn new things and be ready to sell the new product as it comes out of incubation. And it's usually a phase transition. So there's no, there's no uh, financial incentive from the field sales point of view to help that along? Or? Field sales? Yeah. The people that you're talking about, the ones that are <laughs> enterprise sellers, account technology specialists, and account executives, are absolutely incentive on incubation product. Yeah. So the percentage they're responsible for grows over time. Okay. But when we have a brand new thing in the, in the market, we actually started almost like a contest, a sales add-on. We want them to want it, so there's an accelerator that pays them even bigger to go hunt that down and find a place to put it. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. So, um, another client that we work with, and, and before I even go into Telecom Italia, if, if there's one lesson from this case is data. Uh, the ability to get the data and correlate it was very important. So, um, uh, that's also something that we observed in our engagements, is whenever we have good data, things change dramatically. It, it's challenging, it's, it's easier said than done. But for sure, uh, it's, it's the key differentiator in, in our clients' ability to react to change more faster. And this is what happened with Telecom Italia. They were kind enough to let us share the story. They came to our event in Venice. And um, uh, basically what they had is, uh, Telco is changing all the time. There's a new device. There's some, a new trend. Uh, the next one is Windows uh, Phone. And uh, you know all those come and go and, uh, as, as they do. Um, Companies have to adjust. Delco, the carriers have to adjust. And uh, this happened when iPad 2 was launched. It was huge, uh, you know. Uh, and and um, the sales force did not want confusion. Creating clarity immediately was absolutely critical for this to work, and they did. So uh, basically, you know, they had to create something new, uh, be creative, but at the same time implement it. So from the operational point of view and the communication point of view, it was absolutely critical. So another interesting source of, 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 of change is, is the government. Uh, they make you change. And for that, uh, anyone here in banking or subject to major regulation? Uh, OK, not so much. But uh, I think you can relate to some of these stories. Um, as um, they definitely just make you think, force you to do things a little bit more uh, in a more complex fashion. So here's the financial crisis, and uh, in Europe uh, there was this huge, uh, in, in the U.S. as well, you know, people occupied Wall Street, but in Europe there was more outrage with, with the fact that people were making so much money while destroying uh, huge amounts of assets. So um, zoom in to Milan, Italy, where we have Mayor Banca, which is like a diversified, fairly global international uh, financial services group doing business, business all around the, uh, the spectrum of uh, financial services. And what, what happened in Europe was, was extremely interesting because it was not just one law, like, um, you know, remember Sarbanes-Oxley after Enron. It was waves, you know, they kept legislating over and over and over. Every time they did that, compensation plans had to change. So, uh, and, and you have these layers of different rules for, for each year. So what happened is, uh, basically, uh, if you were to simplify that, you are awarding uh, earnings to your employees, but you're not uh, paying them out. And you do that according to uh, some fairly 
complex rules, not complex, but uh, detailed. So you have your 100% uh, on the dot if you add up 2030, 20, 2030, 20, and how that spreads across time is the trick. So uh, basically, before you paid in like two tranches, now you're playing in like 20. Uh, so back to the drawing board, everybody trying, well, how do we solve this? Well, it's, it's, it's more time consuming than complex, as, as I said. But basically, you're spreading pay across time. So you know you have your award across the first period, and that thing is going to uh, uh, pay itself out, depending on the number of criteria. So rather than just saying, well, if you're still my employee, I'll pay you a bonus. Or if you're still my employee, 20 other things happen, then you get that bonus. So uh, that really uh, challenged uh, several of our clients in, in finance. So basically, how do you manage that? Well, basically, it's, it's hard to anticipate what the impact is. So uh, simulation, uh, the, the ability to understand the data before you push out a plan is absolutely critical. So you've got to take all of those ways that people are getting paid, put them in uh, one screen so you can understand that. And uh, one thing that we did uh, is back testing. So if we were to use the rules that are currently in place, in the past using past data, what would that represent? That gave our client the confidence that the numbers were right. So rather than pushing out a plan and hoping for the best, we were able to uh, understand the impact and do some true ups with uh, historical data, and that really helped uh, give them the, uh, the confidence they need. The other leg of uh, our stool here would be how you communicate that to bankers. And um, they now have to understand that uh, the money that comes in comes in many different ways. It depends on a whole bunch of things or criteria. So the uh, the statements became uh, very very complex. Uh, you know, it's not quite so bad when you have half a million euros written at the bottom there. But uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you have to zoom in and understand uh, everything that uh, uh, is instrumental to to your result as as an employee. And we work closely with our clients to make sure uh, they can handle that in a timely fashion. And August, uh, that brings us back to uh, how can you make sure you're paying correctly. David mentioned uh, there's always that uh, insecurity as we're hoping everything is going to the right people in the right amounts. Uh, analytics help you find the outliers. You don't want any of these big balls uh, you know, in the wrong places here. You want things uh, in, within uh, the sort of a, a central normal uh, pattern, and that would help uh, you feel that uh, you know the rules are kind of statistically uh, balancing themselves. Um, so, so we also ask them. Do you guys ask your sales force how they feel about their crop plans? Do you survey them? Feel? I love it. <laughs> It's a balancing. So there is good attrition and bad attrition. There's all kinds of things that play into how you change comp. But it's another barometer. It's something you can add to this analysis. Ask them how they feel about it. Do they like it? Do they understand it? That's one of my problems. I have some complex plans. Do my partners and do my employees understand the plan? If you don't ask them, you'll know. Well, and this is an interesting industry, so we've, we've seen that uh, regularly, repeatedly uh, here. The poor bankers under the NARM inspection, right? Uh, but with that, I would like to switch gears here real quick and show you the unpredictable. We have a little story, and it was so interesting that we made that into a video. that Exentive is providing to businesses might be to look at a true story that happened recently. On March 22, 2010, 
there was a volcano eruption in Iceland, creating a big ash cloud. As a result, most flights in Europe were canceled and all planes were grounded. As it was the first time something like this had happened, no one knew for how long planes would have to stay on the ground. Just a few days, a few weeks, or a few months. Now, let's assume we're a travel agent in Europe during this event. In the travel industry, agents have their commissions paid when the customer is actually taking off. As a result of the volcano eruption, you can only imagine the level of motivation for the agents working for most travel agencies. They are desperate. They're not being paid for the work they actually did. They have no way to earn commissions now, and they don't know for how long the situation will last. But at one of the leading travel agencies, the agents are all very busy actively calling their customers. Why? That company had deployed Exentive to manage the compensation of all their agents. The morning of the eruption, they were able to build, test, deploy, and communicate a new compensation plan to all agents in less than three hours. The updated plan meant agents would be paid at rebooking time instead of takeoff time. That day, this industry leader further increased its advantage compared to its competitors. While most companies were losing their customers with desperate agents, that industry leader managed to keep most of their customers by rebooking them while keeping their entire workforce motivated. The fact is, most of our customers are industry leaders across all industries. So that begs the question, what do industry leaders have in common, and why do they select Exentive? All industry leaders have in common the fact they have decided to differentiate themselves from their competition by leveraging their human capital. By human capital, we mean employees and the external workforce, such as agents or dealers. In addition, they deploy Exentive to better attract, motivate, and retain their people. They achieve this by doing two things. Managing employee performance and compensation by HR, by driving salary reviews, bonus, equity, and non-cash benefits, and managing sales performance and incentive compensation by driving the commissions and incentives for all internal and external sales channels. So, so really the message today is embrace change. Um, we, we're all living it. Everyone raised their hand pretty much in this audience saying that they're in a situation where their business is changing continually. Um, hopefully we'll give you some things to think about today. Um, we hope you'll consider us. We're often a well-kept secret. Um, but uh, please, uh, please come see us. We, we have a demo booth across the hall here. And uh, you know, David will be here as well. And we'd, we'd love the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.